Bonds are one of the many building blocks of the human experience. We're social creatures after all, and for many of us, some of the first bonds we forge are with family. Hello everyone, Golden Nova here, and I have to say, it's good to meet another subscriber milestone. We've just hit 40k, and that means our dual runner is taking a quick detour to the tops, Neo Domino City's lap of luxury for the well-off and wealthy, where we'll find our next signer. Or rather, pair of signers. That's right, the twins Leo and Luna have graced our presence this day, cause it'd be cruel to not cover them together. Uh, it also doesn't help that it doesn't add a lot of extra cards. Uh, that's right, while Leo is known for his collection of Diaclone clones, Luna has a... loose association of mythical creatures that gain life points and protect weak monsters. Which feels kinda crummy, like we just had a whole series of Ishizu retrains, but we haven't had time to refit Luna's roster with some kind of, I don't know, ancient fairy archetype? Well, hopefully a little bit of that Nova magic will conjure some cards into existence, so it's our sworn duty to cover all of the Luna cards, including what is arguably one of the most powerful signer dragons ever printed, before moving on to Leo and his magnificent Morphtronics, as well as another incredibly powerful dragon that is sometimes of the signer variety. Get ready to dance because it takes two for Leo and Luna Explained. But before we continue, make sure to subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what I do. Once we get to 50k, we'll be doing our next 5Ds video on Akiza, and every sub helps. Also, check out my Discord where, uh, someone said this and, uh, I can't get it out of my head. I can't say they're wrong. And my Twitch, where you can watch me put all my lessons to the test live. And if you want to go that extra mile, join my Patreon where you can get my videos early, help us reach these video milestones, and become part of the credits like these lovely people. Thank you all so much for watching, and now, back to the video. Our journey begins by covering all the monsters Luna used during her run in 5Ds. As mentioned previously, there's no overarching archetype or theme, so I can't really give you any guidelines for them. Basically, if she used it in the anime and it's not something that any other character used as some kind of generic card, it's in. That does mean we're cutting Horn of the Unicorn and Swords of Revealing Light because those are clearly DM staples, as well as Dream Sprite and Karibon, which feels like a glaring omission considering this is the second closest thing Luna has to an ace monster, but I already covered it in the Karibo video and I don't really have much to add about it here. First up is Armored White Bear, a level 4 water beast monster with 1800 attack and 1400 defense, and if this card is normal or special summoned while a synchro monster is on the field, you can target a field spell in your grave and add it to your hand. And if this card is destroyed by a battle and sent to the grave, or if this card in your possession is destroyed by an opponent's card effect and sent to the grave, you can special summon a level 4 or lower beast monster from your deck or grave, except a copy of itself. This can help recover field spells that get popped by your ancient fairy dragon, and floats into a couple of other beasts that Luna has. Technically, this will trigger Kalantosa for some removal, basically all the Melfies, Neospatian Dark Panther to steal effects, and any of the rescue monsters. You know, it's good that Luna is expressing some classic American values. You know, because they have the right to bear armored. Bird of Roses is a level 4 wind plant monster with 1800 attack and 1500 defense, and when this phase up attack position card is destroyed by battle with an opponent's attacking monster and sent to the grave, you can special summon two plant type tuner monsters from your deck in face up defense position. Now this looks like it should be an Akiza card, but nope, this was used by Luna, as well as a couple other plants we'll see later on down the line that are, in fact, tuners. But gosh is this floating effect bad! I mean, I'd rather have larger attack than smaller, sure, but only triggering when an attack position and being attacked is the worst! I don't care what the card says, this flower has like, zero power. Nettles is a level 2 earth plant tuner monster with 1200 attack and 400 defense, and if this face up card would be destroyed, you can destroy a face up plant type monster you control instead. It's a little tuner that's got a destruction replacement effect, that's uh... Well, mechanically, that's all there is to it, but they actually find themselves on a few other cards, most notable of which being that grass looks greener. Uh oh. Grass. Making them a part of meta history, because the card advantage it gets you is very likely to be a nettle positive. Spore is a level 1 wind plant tuner monster with 400 attack and 800 defense, and if this card is in your grave, you can banish another plant type monster from your grave to special summon this card from your grave and increase its level by the level of the banished monster. However, each player can only activate the effect of Spore once per duel. Now this is a strong ass card, being an integral part of plant synchro back in the day. 
and it's not hard to see why. It's an easy to access tuner with cards like One for One, and works extremely well with Lone Fire Blossom, since you can use its effect to summon Spore out of your deck, Synchro Summon, then banish the Lone Fire from your grave to get a level 4 Spore tuner. It's so good in fact that it kind of needs that once per duel limitation, cause then it would get completely out of hand. Not to mention all the anti-fungal work you'd have to do, but you can't let those spores get out of control. I've seen The Last of Us, I know what happens. Fairy Archer is a level 3 light fairy monster with 1400 attack and 600 defense, and during your main phase you can inflict 400 damage to your opponent for each face up light monster you control. This card can't attack during the same turn you activate this effect, and only one fairy archer can have its effect activated per turn. So because of that we can't just stack a whole bunch of damage in one turn. Which I guess is a valid concern, because even before the EMZ, that was a potential 2,000 points of damage per activation on a full field, and I know Yu-Gi-Oh players would try to find a way to FTK with that. But thankfully, it does have that limitation, and even as is, it's pretty difficult to get the full value out of, so I don't think that play sequence really had a shot. Fairy King Truesdale is a level 6 water plant monster with 2200 attack and 1500 defense, and when this card is in defense position, all plant type monsters you control gain 500 attack and defense, which effectively gives Truesdale 2000 defense and provides a pretty substantial bonus to your other plants. And this stacks, so as far as budget plant options go, well, you could certainly do worse. Even the level 6 is kind of good for extra deck summoning. But I've gotta say, the Truesdale siblings must have had a huge rebellious streak to disown plants to play exclusively machines. Regulus is a level 4 light beast monster with 1700 attack and 1000 defense, and once per turn you can select a field spell card in your grave and return it to the deck. So we've got another way to recycle field spells, though it's not quite as good as Armored Bear if you already have a synchro monster. But aside from that, nah, this card has nothing. You know what, Regulus? How about I set you up with a trip to the Land of Iron? I've heard of these things called Therians that are ready to set you up with some wild effects. Sunlight Unicorn is a level 4 light beast monster with 1800 attack and 1000 defense, and once per turn you can excavate the top card of your deck, and if it's an equip spell card, you add it to your hand. Otherwise, place it on the bottom of your deck. This is literally only used to get Horn of the Unicorn in one episode, and then a synchro material from that point on. And because Luna has no specific equipped spells, it has nothing to do with the even loose association with your field spells. But it does look like Galaran Rapidash, so I'll give it a pass. Sunny Pixie is a level 1 light spellcaster tuner monster with 300 attack and 400 defense, and if this card is sent to the grave for the synchro summon of a light synchro monster, you gain a thousand life points. And that's it! You get life points, it's got a neat level in typing, though to be fair, it's nothing Effect Veiler can't do themselves, so I'd rather Pixie them over Sunny any day. Ancient Forest is a field spell card, and when you activate this card, change any defense position monster on the field to phase up attack position, and flip effects are not activated at this time. And if a monster attacks, destroy it at the end of that turn's battle phase. This is kind of appropriate. It does dissuade people away from battling, which was pretty on brand. And it's got kind of a neat effect. If anything, when activated, it can unstick monsters that are trapped under Floodgate Trap Hole or Grounding Mirror Force. Though the field spell does present a rather tricky philosophical dilemma. Ancient Forest may proclaim to be a pacifist, but by destroying monsters that battle, isn't that enacting violence in an attempt to promote non-violence? Emergency Assistance is a normal spell card that you can only activate during your main phase too, and it special summons a level 4 monster from your grave that was destroyed by a card effect and sent to the grave this turn. Um, wow, just wow. So if your special summoned main deck Zodiac monster is destroyed in battle against a, I don't know, an El Shadal construct, you can get it back, sure. I mean, it's meant to work with Ancient Forest, but still, only level 4s? Come on! I think this card needs some emergency assistance in the consultation department. Fairy Wind is a normal trap card that destroys as many face-up spells and traps on the field as possible, except this card, and if you do, each player takes damage equal to the total number of cards destroyed by this effect, times 300. Now, this has seen some minor amount of competitive play, especially when things like Floodgates get really out of control. Lightning Storm is way more valuable now, but before that was an option, Fairy Wind was a way to clear out a ton of back row and deal some chip damage. It might hurt you too, but it does get you closer to closing out the game, so it's more than worth it. And in the worst case scenario, it's a really funny way to concede. Pixie Ring is a continuous trap card, and while you control two or more face-up attack position monsters, your opponent can't target your monsters with the lowest attack for an attack. 
This can keep your weakest monsters safe from getting run over, but if your weakest two monsters have the same attack, both will be safe. And if all your monsters have the same attack, then none of them can be targeted because now all your monsters have the lowest attack. Though it's not because the pixie ring has any particular magic or special powers, rather all monsters are just really suspicious about messing with pixie circles. Alright, here's the big monster, Luna's Ace and Combo Enabler Supreme, Ancient Fairy Dragon, a level 7 light dragon synchro monster with 2100 attack and 3000 defense, requiring generic material. Once per turn, you can special summon a level 4 or lower monster from your hand, but you can't conduct your battle phase the turn you activate this effect. And once per turn, you can destroy as many field spells on the field as possible, and if you do, gain a thousand life points, then you can add a field spell from your deck to your hand. Ooh, goodness, where do I begin with this? Uh, so it's generic, and level 7 synchros are super easy to make. It's a soft once per turn, so making more copies means more special summons from your hand. And as a level 7, it's a great rung to synchro climb with. Not to mention being a synchro non-tuner gives you access to some silly cards. And none of that goes into to the field spell interactions. The life point gain is nice, but the real draw is that you can cycle out field spells. Something that's become even more powerful, the stronger the average field spell becomes. You can cycle through searching field spells, which is another soft once per turn, and now it takes out two field spells ever since they made it so two field spells could be active at the same time. Something that was not the case when Ancient Fairy Dragon first came out. It may not seem like much on the surface, but this card is packed to the brim with value, with the only downside being that Ancient Fairy Dragon has some unsettlingly long features. Now, if you want to play this card at a tournament because uh, Ancient Fairy Dragon is banned, you can try its manga version, Ancient Pixie Dragon. They have all the same stats and even synchro material requirements, just that it's dark instead of light. While on the field, after resolving a field spell card that was activated during your turn, you draw a card. And this effect does have a hard once per turn. And once per turn, you can target a face-up attack position monster on the field and destroy that target, but there must be a face-up field spell card on the field to activate and resolve this effect. This is a much more aggressive version of the card, but to be fair, all the manga dual dragons are kind of unhinged. It's cool to get some draw power and removal every turn, but it's nowhere near as broken as Fairy Dragon, which is nice depending on how you think about it. But you want to know the really messed up thing here? Luna doesn't even use this card in the manga. Leo does, come on. At this point, why did the writers even include them as twins? Alright, that's everything related to Luna, now it's time to talk about an actual archetype, Morphtronics. Debuting in the November 2008 core set, Crossroads of Chaos, this theme is mainly made of machines, but their most prevalent feature is their modular effects. Each Morphtronic has two different effects, and the one you have access to depends on the Morphtronic's battle position. This makes position changing effects very relevant to make sure we access the effects we need, as well as being able to special summon those monsters so they aren't locked into attack position via normal summoning. First up is Morphtronic Selfon, a level 1 earth machine monster with 100 attack and defense, and while in attack position once per turn, you can roll a 6 sided die and reveal cards from the top of your deck equal to the roll, and special summon a level 4 or lower or Morphtronic monster from among them, ignoring summoning conditions. Then shuffle the rest back into your deck. And while in defense position, you can also roll a die once per turn to look at the top cards of your deck equal to the number rolled, and return them to the top of your deck in the same order. So you're not able to rearrange them to set up your plays, but you do get to see what you're in store for. Though, to be fair, the attack position effect is way better, especially if you can stack your deck with a Morphtronic, like with Plague Spreader Zombie. Because at that point, no matter what you roll, you'll have access to one that can answer the call. Morphtronic Lantron is a level 1 light machine tuner monster with 200 attack and defense, and while in attack position, any effect damage you would take from an opponent's card effect is inflicted to your opponent instead. And while in defense position, when this card is destroyed by a battle and sent to the grave, you take no battle damage this turn. So you can either set this to protect from a huge push for damage, or normal summon it to punish trick stars. It's a pretty do-nothing set of effects, but in the right situation, it can really land turn things around. Morphtronic Magnon Bar is a level 1 Earth Thunder monster with 100 attack and defense. In attack position, once per turn, if you control exactly two other face-up attack position monsters, and no additional monsters, this card gains the combined attack of the other two monsters you control until the end phase. And those other monsters can't attack the turn you activate this effect. And while in defense position, monsters you control can't attack. Uh, wait. Um, I guess it's 
funny if you give this card to your opponent while in defense position, but, you know, they can just put it to attack position. But the attack effect is actually kind of cool. It's like the most generic yet restricted Sirocco ever printed, and it can make Magnum Bar pretty big. And you can just link away the monsters that you used for the attack boost so you aren't losing any offensive pressure. The art is even trying to tell you the right way to use this. NS, Normal Summon Magnum Bar. Morphtronic Smart Fawn is a level 1 Earth Machine Tuner monster with 100 attack and defense that can't be normal summoned or set, and must first be special summoned from your hand by banishing a Morphtronic monster from your grave. A bit of a toughie on the restriction, but now you can summon it however you like for maximum effectiveness. While on attack position once per turn, you can roll a 6-sided die, excavate that many cards from the top of your deck, and add an excavated Morphtronic card to your hand. Also shuffle the rest into the deck. And while in defense position once per turn, you can roll a 6-sided dice, look at that many cards from the top of your deck, then place either of them on either the top or bottom of your deck in any order. This really is a smarter phone, because now you can manipulate the top card of your deck with a defense effect. The adding to hand effect doesn't mobilize you like special summoning would, but that means you can order some support spells and traps as well. It truly is the DoorDash of Yu-Gi-Oh! Morphtronic Telephone is a level 1 Earth Machine Tuner monster with 100 attack and defense. While in attack position once per turn during your main phase, you can roll a 6-sided dice and gain life points equal to the result times 100. Then you can special summon a Morphtronic monster from your grave with a level equal to or lower than the result. While in defense once per turn during your main phase, you can roll a 6-sided die, excavate that many cards from the top of your deck, or as many as you can, and if you do, you can send an excavated Morphtronic card to the grave, also place the rest on either the top or bottom of your deck in any order. Ooh, this caused quite a stir when it was revealed because it lacks the critical except a copy of Morphtronic Telephone onto its special summon from the grave effect. This means you can create an infinite loop of Link climbing, using one Telephone to summon one in your grave, then using the other as material over and over again, gaining a wild amount of life points. Fortunately, there are so many pieces of interaction in modern Yu-Gi-Oh to stop this combo, so it isn't really sustainable in a larger event. But if you can pull it off, it's unstoppable. What surprises me is that this is the strongest of the phone-based Morphtronics, but it's based on the most primitive tech. Like, what the heck even is a landline? Morphtronic Vacuum N is a level 1 wind machine monster with zero attack and defense, and when in attack position once per turn, you can send an equipped card equipped to this card to the grave to burn your opponent for 500 damage. But while in defense position once per turn, you can equip a face-up attack position monster your opponent controls to this card as an equipped card, and can only be equipped with one monster at a time by this effect. That's right, we've got a relinquished on our hands! Remember when that used to be the effect of a terrifying eldritch boss monster at the end of an arc? Now a little kid can just vacuum up your monster, no big deal. It's actually really cool to have removal like this, so long as you can special summon it right in defense position, because most threats are going to be special summoned in attack position, not least of which being, you know, Link monsters. And if it's able to get to attack position after that, then you can do a little burn, freeing up some space to do it all over again. This card may be old, and it may be a very clunky looking Roomba, but this is one card that doesn't suck. Morphtronic Cameron is a level 2 light machine monster with 800 attack and 600 defense. While in attack position, when this card is destroyed by battle, you can special summon a level 4 or lower Morphtronic monster from your hand or grave, except a copy of itself. And while in defense position, Morphtronic monsters on the field can't be targeted by effects. This does include your own effects, which is kinda cringe, but at least you can turn that off in case you need access to them. The float only working while in attack position is also very unfortunate, along with only being able to summon from the hand or grave but you are able to crash Cameron in as needed, so at least you have some agency when using this effect. Just don't go stir-crazy triggering this effect over and over, otherwise you're gonna be photo-finished. Morphtronic Clockin is a level 2 Earth Machine monster with 600 attack and 1100 defense, and when in attack position, this card gains 1000 attack for each morph counter on it. And while in defense position, once per turn, you can place a morph counter on this card. You can also tribute this card to inflict 1000 damage to your opponent for each morph counter counter on this card. That's right, we've got a wave motion cannon on legs. You can either save up a lot of counters to beat face, or trade them in for some significant burn. Or, with some clever position changing effects, both. Like, it literally puts your opponent on the 8 turn clock, how funny is that? 
Morphtronic Borden is a level 3 Earth Machine monster with 500 attack and 1800 defense. When in attack position, Morphtronic monsters can attack directly, and while in defense position, other Morphtronic monsters you control can't be destroyed by battle. Thankfully, it only says other, not except Morphtronic Borden, so two defense position Bordens will protect each other and the rest of your crew. And once you've assembled lethal, you can turn them upright and begin the skateboard-based carnage, which goes a really long way towards pretending you're a Superman. Morphtronic Datatron is a level 3 fire pyro monster with 1200 attack and 600 defense. While in attack position, you contribute one monster to burn your opponent for 600 damage, and while in defense position once per turn, you can just burn your opponent for 300 damage without a tribute. This is easily the funniest Morphtronic, because looking at the OCG art, yeah, it's a pocket lighter, and it lines up very well with its type, attribute, and effect. But what does Data have to do with any of it? Well. They couldn't have a lighter be a monster in a children's card game. What if it encouraged the youth to smoke a cigarette? So instead, they slapped two gigabytes on the side and altered the markings on the head, removing the nozzle, and voila, it's a USB stick instead. Like I said, very funny, but also pretty clever, even if it does have nothing to do with the effect. Unless it's got some kind of protective software on it, because then it'd be a firewall. Morphtronic Magnon is a level 3 Earth Thunder monster with 800 attack and defense. While in attack position, if your opponent controls a face-up monster, this card can only select their highest attack monster as an attack target. And while in defense position, your opponent can't select another monster as an attack target. This combos very well with Borden, making it so if both monsters are in defense position, you've manufactured another kind of attack lock. Though it still allows for attacking, so piercing battle damage or attack battle triggers will still go off. So if you can, just get two defense position magnums, then you have a real attack lock. Though all things considered, would that make the attack position effect thematically consistent? Well, I am always asking the devs to make mechanics that reflect the cards, so good job, I guess? Morphtronic Remotin is a level 3 Earth Machine Tuner Monster with 300 attack and 1200 defense. While in attack position, you can target a Morphtronic monster in your grave. You banish that target and add a Morphtronic monster with the same level as the target from your deck to your hand. While in defense position, you can send a Morphtronic monster from your hand to the grave and add another Morphtronic with the same level as the sent monster from your grave to your hand. This makes for a pretty neat searcher, though the levels having to match does mean you're restricted on what you can search or recover at any given time. But being a level 3 tuner is still pretty valuable, so combined with the possibility of additional value, you'll just have to contend with the fact that this card is very difficult to find. Remotes always end up in the worst places after all. Morphtronic Scopin is a level 3 light machine tuner monster with 800 attack and 1400 defense. While in attack position, you can special summon a level 4 Morphtronic monster from your hand, but destroy it during the end phase. And while in defense position, this card is treated as a level 4 monster while face up. This is actually one of your better tuners, as it can immediately set you up with a level 7 synchro play, or level 8 synchros, or rank 4 plays if this card is in defense position. And of course, there's always those valuable Link 2s. So you could once again be stuck with an effect that doesn't line up with your hand, but it still does a great job of expanding the scope of your gameplay. Morphtronic Boom Boxin is a level 4 Earth Machine monster with 1200 attack and 400 defense. While in attack position, this card can attack twice during each battle phase, and while in defense position, when a face-up Morphtronic monster you control is targeted for an attack, you can negate the attack. Boom Boxin is a very solid member of our team, providing good protection while on the defensive, while helping apply a lot of offensive pressure. Combine this with Borden and you've got 2400 points of direct damage, and because of that double attack, any attack boosting effects are doubly as effective. I'm telling you, Boom Boxen's got those good vibrations. Morphtronic Radeon is a level 4 light thunder monster with 1000 attack and 900 defense. While in attack position, all Morphtronic monsters you control gain 800 attack, and while in defense position, all Morphtronic monsters you control gain 1000 defense. This effectively makes Radeon an 1800 attack and 1900 defense monster, which is a pretty spiffy stat line. And this stacks, so one of the main ways you're going to go for the win is by summoning as many Radeons as possible to make sure your entire lineup is absolutely cut. Then swing in directly with an attack position Borden to bypass your opponent's monster lineup. Bonus points if you get Boom Boxing in on the mix, because as I stated previously, their double attack gets double benefits from the boost. Also, can we appreciate that Radeon's weapon is an earbud they're whirling around like a chain sickle? What a badass. 
Morphtronic Slingin is a level 4 wind machine monster with 1200 attack and 800 defense. While in attack position, once per turn, you can tribute a Morphtronic monster, except a copy of itself, to destroy a card on the field. And while in defense position, if this card would be destroyed, you can destroy another Morphtronic monster you control instead. Not a huge fan of the second effect, but keeping it around longer can be nice if you have plenty of Morphtronics to feed it, especially because its attack position effect is a worse scrap dragon, trading one of your on theme monsters for any of your opponent's cards. And considering how our card quality will stack up against our opponents, uh, you're usually going to get the better end of the deal. And that's the kind of thing you want to see in a series of cards this old, because it really does give you a sling and shot at victory. Morphtronic Staplin is a level 4 Earth Machine monster with 1400 attack and 1000 defense. While in attack position, your opponent can't select another monster as an attack target. If this card is destroyed by battle, the monster that destroyed it loses 300 attack permanently. While in defense position, this card can't be destroyed by battle, and if this card is attacked after damage calculation, select a face-up attack position monster your opponent controls. You change the targeted monster to defense position, and change this card to attack position. So while in attack, Staplin basically has the same defense position effect as Magnin, so now you have even more ways to set up an attack lock. That seems to be coming up a lot this episode. Hmm. Staplin is basically chock full of effects to dissuade or prevent your opponent from attacking, which doesn't really tie together thematically with the image of the card. Like, I'd expect it to combine the properties of two cards, either enhancing the best properties of yours or exploiting the weaknesses of your opponents. As it is now, it can help with the stall versions of the deck, but otherwise I wouldn't exactly call it a staple. Morphtronic Videon is a level 4 light machine monster with 1000 attack and defense. While in attack position, it gains 800 attack for each equipped card equipped to it, and while in defense position, this card gains 800 defense for each equipped card equipped to it, making this an interesting mix of the previously mentioned Radeon and Mahavila. It opens up the possibility of using more utility-minded cards while letting Videon handle the offensive pressure, and in combination with the Power Tools Dragon package, it synergizes pretty well with the other equip effects and cards we'll see later on. Also, it it makes videos! It's just like me, for real! Morphtronic Scannon is a level 6 Earth Machine Tuner monster with 1500 attack and 600 defense that can't be normal summoned or set, and must first be special summoned from your hand by banishing a Morphtronic monster from your hand. Hmm, not a very advantageous place to banish cards from, which I'd be a bit more forgiving of if this wasn't released in 2022. While in attack position, once per turn during your main phase, you can add a Morphtronic Spell or Trap card from your deck to your hand, then place a card from your hand on top of your deck. And while in defense position, you can do the same thing, but this time with a level 4 or lower Morphtronic monster from your grave to your hand. So it's a net neutral way to fix up your hand, with the latter effect only usable once your grave is set up a little. Though that's balanced out by the fact that the deck searching effect is almost universally useful, and being able to special summon it from your hand means you can access either effect fairly quickly. Not to mention being such a large tuner helps access some powerful synchros at higher levels. I may not be entirely sold on it, but it scans. Our last Morphtronic is actually a Synchro. Morphtronic Earfawn is a level 4 Earth Machine Synchro monster with 1200 attack and 1800 defense, requiring generic material. While this card is an equipped card, the equipped monster can make up to two attacks on monsters during each battle phase. And if this card is special summoned, you can target a face-up monster on the field and treat it as a tuner until the end of the turn. You can also target a Synchro monster on the field and equip this card from the field or grave to it. So this is basically a nifty tiny Synchro, even if you're not playing a Morphtronic deck. Effects that make other monsters tuners lends a ton of flexibility to your synchro climbing. Now, Irfan can act as the much-valued synchro tuner, or can pass that off to another monster in case the synchro has to be the non-tuner material, or really for whatever combination that fits your fancy. And from that point forward, every synchro you make can have a double attack on monsters for free, making them wildly more threatening for no reason. The only thing you have to make sure you have is ways to make lower-leveled synchros, which Morphtronics are already equipped to do but it might not play so well in other decks. Either way, it's about time Morphtronics actually got their own Synchro monster, even if it isn't really what I'd call a boss monster. And look, they're even modeled after Leo and Luna, that's so cute! But that's not all the monsters we need to talk about today, because there's also a bunch of gadget monsters, but not the iconic Yugi gadgets, you know, red, green, yellow, the boot up monsters. No, Leo just has a bunch of random stuff. For instance, Gadget Driver is a level 1 Earth Machine monster with 200 attack and defense that's... a screwdriver. Heck, it even does the Morphtronic thing where it shows their object form in the background, but... it's 
not a Morph Tronic. Uh, anyway, you can send this card from your hand to the grave and select any number of face-up Morph Tronic monsters you control to change the battle position of these selected monsters, and this effect can be activated during either player's turn. So, because this is a quick effect, this is basically a hand trap for Morphtronics, letting you manipulate positions to get the right effect at the right time. Just kinda sucks that it's not a Morphtronic, so it doesn't synergize with the rest of our effects. Like, we can't add this to our hand with Smart Fawn, which I imagine would be very useful. But, because it's not, the whole core of the theme seems a little screwed. Gadget Arms is a level 2 water machine flip monster with 200 attack and 400 defense, and when flipped, you can select a Morphtronic Speller Trap card in your grave and add it to your hand. Now, we actually have some pretty good cards to recycle with this, but as usual, unless your deck has a plan for flip monsters, it'll be too slow to be effective. And since this is our only flip monster, it's not really grabbing me. Gadget Gamer is a level 3 Earth Machine monster with 300 attack and defense, and when this card is normal summoned, you can add a level 1 machine monster from your deck to your hand. And you can tribute this card to special summon a Morphtronic monster from your hand, then you can special summon a Gadget Hauler from your hand or deck. We'll get to Gadget Hauler in just a bit, but focusing on Gamer here, it's... it's fine. This actually does search Gadget Driver, which is pretty cool, as well as a number of Morphtronics, though notably not Magnum Bar. And if you did search one of those monsters, you can tribute this to put it onto the field immediately and in whichever position is best for you. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the card that you searched, so you could summon Boom Boxin, Radeon, Borden, all while getting an extra body on board to help with things like Synchro or Link Summoning. The name is, of course, infamously funny, but honestly, it's going to be hard to find some legacy support that lap tops this. Gadget Hauler is a level 6 Earth Machine monster with 1300 attack and 0 defense, and once per turn, you can send any number of Morphtronic monsters from your hand to the grave to have this card gain 800 attack for each. This bonus is permanent, and even by discarding just 2 monsters, you have a 2900 attack monster on your hand. But you're also going minus a lot to just make a big monster. Even when it's easier to summon with Gadget Gamer and with the aforementioned example of boosting, it still doesn't clear common extra deck threats like Barone or Borload Savage. But do I think this makes it useless? Well, previously yes, but with the help of Gadget Gamer, we actually have a really potent combo piece, if only for its level. If the Morphtronic you summon with Gamer's effect is a tuner, Holler makes for great non-tuner material. And if it's combined with the recently released Scannon, you have the monsters needed to make Ultimaya Zulkin. Two level 6 monsters, one being a tuner, one being a non-tuner. Scannon even searches you a spell or trap card that you can set to the field to trigger Zulkin's effect, which can in turn summon all your Signer Dragons. It took him about 14 years, but now, this card is quite the haul. Alright, now it's time for the Morphtronic spells and traps, and we'll be starting with another card that isn't name stamped as a Morphtronic. Uh, at least it's pretty good. Junk Box is a normal spell card that has you selecting and special summoning a level 4 or lower Morphtronic monster from your grave, but destroy it during the end phase. This might seem unfortunate, and without a follow-up play, it does suck, but as part of a whole, it's a great way to get your monsters out of the grave to get material and leverage their effects, and once again, in whichever position is needed for your current situation. Boom Boxin can push in for that last piece of damage, Borden can provide the direct attacks needed, Radeon can give you the buff, Cellphon and Smartphon can get you more advantage, or just, you know, start the telephone loop. Shame we can't search this with Scannon, but that doesn't make this card a piece of junk. In fact, that's a whole separate video. Morphtronic Accelerator is a normal spell card that returns a Morphtronic monster from your hand to the deck to destroy a card on the field and draw a card. So, technically, this is an even trade. The draw makes it a minus one, which is balanced out by destroying an opponent's card. And if you drew a Morphtronic you don't want, it's a good way to shuffle back a brick. But if your only available Morphtronics are ones that you want to play, then you have to give up a combo piece, which kind of sucks. But it's still searchable removal with an honestly absurd range, especially for the time period it came out in. Though it does more to put the brakes on your opponent's game plan rather than accelerate your own. Morphtronic Converter is a normal spell card that targets a machine monster you control and applies the following effect, depending on the targeted monster's battle position. If it's an attack position, you special summon a Morphtronic monster from your deck with a different name than the targeted monster, then place the targeted monster on top of your deck. And if it was in defense, you can change that targeted monster to attack position, and if you do, special summon a level 4 or lower machine monster from your hand. This has some interesting applications. The art is certainly giving you a big clue. 
If you target a Machine Morphtronic in attack position, you can summon Self on from your deck, then no matter what you roll on the die, you're guaranteed to summon a monster. But you can also just summon whichever Morphtronic you need besides Scannon because of their summon restrictions. The defense position effect though can technically be used in any machine deck, especially ones that use level 4 and lower monsters. Gadgets would be kind of funny if you paired them with something like Stumbling, then you can summon the gadget you search to get another gadget. But that's really convoluted. Ironically, I think this card could have seen a lot of play in Super Heavy Samurais as a way to leverage monsters that aren't going to stay on the field for long, thus not needing to worry about them staying in defense position, if not for them being allergic to spells and traps. At the very least, it does mean you have better splash ability with random machine monsters you want to play, and it's always nice to incorporate random tech picks into the deck, letting you convert one game plan into another. Factory of 100 Machines is a quick play spell that removes from play all Morphtronic monsters from your grave to target a face-up machine monster you control and give it a 200 attack boost for each card removed until the end phase. Yeah, just another piece of machine Morphtronic support, and it's really not doing it for me. We have no banish synergies, and the boost per banish is pretty weak. I mean, if you did banish 100 machines, that would win you the game if a bit overkill, but considering deck size maximums, that's, um, impossible. Gadget Box is a continuous spell card that's always treated as a Morphtronic card, which is very nice! When this card is activated, you can place three Morph Counters on it, and once per turn you can remove a Morph Counter from your field, and if you do, Special Summon a Gadget Box token, a level 1 Earth Machine monster with zero attack and defense that itself doesn't count as a Morphtronic. Thanks! And while this token is in the monster zone, the player who summoned it can't special summon monsters from the extra deck, except synchro monsters. Now, notably, you can only activate one gadget box per turn, but the token generation effect is a soft once per turn, so the more gadget boxes you can place, the more tokens you can make. And while these cards have a limited amount of counters, we do have other ways of making them, so it's not the end of the world. As for functionality, it can basically give you a free level to help with Synchro Summoning, and Synchro Summoning only since it has the Sword Soul restriction. Also, can we just get Narada to give this whole gadget as Morphtronic condition to all the associated gadgets, please? Toolbox is a continuous spell card, and if you control a monster, you can reveal two equipped spells with different names from your deck. Your opponent randomly picks one for you to add to your hand, and you place the other on the bottom of your deck. This is a pretty cool card, you just get a free equip spell each turn. And while it has nothing to do with Morphtronic specifically, it is used by Leo in the manga, and the equip sub theme is pretty prevalent. But, um, I just don't like that it looks at me. Why does it have a tongue? What does the toolbox use the tongue for? Morphtronic Cord is an equip spell card that can only be equipped to a Morphtronic monster. Each time the equipped monster changes battle position, you destroy a spell or trap card on the field. This is not once per turn, and it is mandatory. This can be a problem when spells and traps start running dry and you have to start destroying your own cards, and if you need to change the Morphtronic's position for its other effect, that can be detrimental, even if it just means destroying your own cord. And the most frustrating part? It's not even a USB micro, so don't even think about trying to charge your cell phone with this. Proprietary hardware sucks. Morphtronic Engine is an equip spell card that you can only equip to a level 3 or lower Morphtronic monster, and its attack becomes double its original attack. And during your second standby phase after this card's activation, destroy this card and take damage equal to the original attack of the equipped monster. That's, a uh, fine, I guess. All the Morphtronic monsters we want to have attacking are level 4, so just outside the equipable range for some reason. So the only monster worth attaching this to is Datatron, turning it into a decently sized 2400 attack body. I just wish it was worth playing more. And what I find funny is that they thought this was too good, so they had to give it a self-destruct timer with the Power Bond drawback. It's not even an engine piece, get it together. Morphtronic Repair Unit is an equip spell card that sends a Morphtronic monster from your hand to the grave and selects a Morphtronic monster in your grave to special summon and equip it with this card. However, its battle position cannot be changed, and when this card is removed from the field, destroy the equipped monster. So it's an archetypal premature burial with downside that also shuts off position changing. This card is so odd. The only good part is that well, it's a Reborn, but also that as long as you have a Morphtronic engraved to activate the effect, you can summon the Morphtronic you discard to give you, like, a quick little summon before using the monster for something else. So it's not 
terrible, but I'd recommend going to get a refund from whatever shop got you that repair job because this one stinks. Morphtronic Rusty Engine is an equipped spell card that can be equipped to any Morphtronic monster, and if the equipped monster is destroyed, inflict damage to each player equal to its original attack. So already I like this way more than regular engine, because this at least burns your opponent and you can equip it to any Morphtronic, so thankfully this can actually help you end a game. You might even get away with putting this on a monster with more attack than your opponent has life points, to effectively win the game on the spot. I mean it still sucks, but if you're just trying to shake the rust off, this is a nice start. Morphtronic Map is a field spell card, and each time a monster's battle position is changed, place a morph counter on this card. All Morphtronic monsters gain 300 attack for each morph counter on this card, and when this card is destroyed and sent from the field to the grave, you can special summon a Morphtronic monster from your grave. This is actually kind of a based field spell. The attack boost per counter can get very strong, and this checks for any time battle positions are changed for every monster on the field, including your opponents. And then, if your opponent destroys it, at least in a way that doesn't miss timing, you get a free morph tronic back from your grave. And the new gadget box card now has a way to generate morph counters that you can use if they ever run out. But what is the map looking for? Who can say? Maybe it's a location to find the imposter among these morph tronics. Don't look now! but one of these tools is not part of the archetype. Morph Transition is a normal trap card that can only be activated when a face-up Morphtronic monster you control is selected as an attack target. Negate the attack and change the battle position of the selected Morphtronic monster. This has some situational usages that are outside of just stopping attacks, like maybe one of your attack lockers is out of alignment and this can help fix it. Or you can stop an attack heading for a boom box and that's either already used its attack negate, or is an attack so that you can change it to defense to get that negate. But in most other situations, it's just an attack negate, nothing more. But really, that's how it should be. Like, it shouldn't have to fulfill some kind of grander design. If morph transitioning makes you happy, you should be able to do it. Morphtronic Impact Return is a normal trap card that targets up to two spell and trap cards your opponent controls. You shuffle a Morphtronic monster from your hand into the deck, and if you do, shuffle the targeted cards into the deck. You can also banish this card from your grave, then target one of your Morphtronic monsters that's banished or in your grave and special summon it in defense position. But you can only use one effect per turn, and only once per turn. I want to like this card, I really do, but it only removes back row and you still have to shuffle a Morphtronic from your hand to activate this. But the grave effect is nice. It even summons banished Morphtronics to work with Remoten, Scannon, Smartphone, and I guess 100 Machines Factory. But like, how do you get it in the grave? It's got potential, but I don't see it having much of an impact. Morphtronic Mix-Up is a normal trap card, and if you control two or more face-up Morphtronic monsters, select two cards your opponent controls, and destroy one card of your opponent's choice from those two. I... I hate this. I really hate it. Why can't you just at least give me the chance to pop one of them without giving my opponent the chance to mess with me? This can't be right. There must have been some kind of mix-up at the development offices or something. Morphtronics Scramble is a normal trap card that you can only activate when your opponent declares a direct attack while you control no monsters. You negate the attack and special summon a Morphtronic monster from your hand. We've seen similar stuff like this in the past. A Hero Emerges is very similar to this, but despite having two series worth of design knowledge from then to now, Scramble does very little to improve the formula. Sure, you can't whiff on this, but now it only triggers on a direct attack and one where you have no monsters, so if your opponent has a way to bypass your monsters, this still won't trigger. Like, it's a rare occurrence, true, but you at least shouldn't have specifically locked that off for crying out loud. This isn't the worst scramble card, a Sonic Chick support card holds that title, but it's not for lack of trying. Power Up Adapter is a normal trap card that you can equip to one of your face-up Morphtronic monsters you control. The equipped monster can't attack, but you do select another face-up monster on the field, and it gains attack equal to the attack of the equipped monster. Basically, this effect is similar to the Crusadia Link monsters. Most of them have effects where monsters they point to can't attack, but they gain attack from those monsters. So Power Up Adapter was... ahead of its time, I guess? 
Uh, either way, this card isn't really good, especially because Morphtronics aren't exactly packing a lot of attack points to transfer over. But if you'll indulge me for a second, researching this uncovered a really strange ruling. See, you might think that if Power Up Adapter leaves the field, the monster that gained attack would lose the attack, but that's not the case. See, it applies the anti-attack effect to what it's equipped to, but it just gives the attack bonus to the second monster. It doesn't apply one of those pseudo-equips like Call of the Haunted. If it's equipped to the second monster, that might be the case, but it only does so on the first one. So, once it all resolves, you could conceivably just pop Power Up Adapter with MST so the equipped monster could attack again, and the boost that you gave remains, essentially giving you an extra monster's attack worth of damage. It's almost certainly not what the designers intended, but we work with the card text we have, not the card text we think it should have. Well, until an errata comes out anyway. Until then, we're all just going to have to adapt. Morphtronic Monotron is a continuous trap card, and when a Morphtronic monster is summoned, you can change it to face-up defense position. Hey, wait a second, I thought we were done with the monsters! And that's true, we don't have an extra trap monster to add to the theme. This is cool because it does help with one of the issues I expounded upon previously, how important it is to be able to access your defense mode effects after normal summoning. And it's optional, unlike Stumbling. So if you need the attack version, you can still use it. The problem is that they thought this effect was just too good. So they put it on a turn delay as a continuous trap card because heavens forbid you have access to a defense position vacuum in on turn one. See, this is why we need to increase the power of surveillance culture. Morphtronic Bind is a continuous trap card, and while you control a face-up Morphtronic monster, all level four or higher monsters your opponent controls can't attack or change their battle positions. Finally, more Gravity Binds! Though, to be fair, this is, or was, kind of a cool archetypal floodgate. It only applied to your opponent, and level 4 was the standard at the time. Not to mention it was basically a blanket hit against Synchros. This allowed you more time to set up your plays to go in for the OTK. But now that Xyz and Link monsters exist, not to mention that boss monsters in general have even more proactive removal than ever before, and this is after Scrap Dragon, mind you, and you'll find that this cell contract isn't quite as binding as it was in the past. Morphtronic Force Field is a counter trap card that negates the activation of a spell or trap card that would destroy a face up Morphtronic monster you control and destroy it. And it adds a Morphtronic card from your deck to your hand? Wow, that's. That's cool, actually. A counter trap that lets you go plus one? The issue is that it's so narrow. It excludes monster effects and only works against spells and traps that not just destroy, but destroy face up Morphtronics specifically. So you have insurance against the monster destroying effect of Lightning Storm, Dark Hole, and Raigeki, but this does jack all against Imperm, Ice Dragon's Prison, Evenly Matched, Droplets, Feather Duster, etc. I just love all these cards being just one or two words away from actually being good, but nothing will shield us from bad card design. That about does it for the Morphtronics, now we turn our gaze to another of the Signer Dragons, or at the very least, an aspect of it. That's right, this section is all about covering the cards related to Power Tool Dragon, a level 7 Earth Machine Synchro Monster with 2300 attack and 2500 defense, requiring generic material. Once per turn, you can reveal three equip spells from your deck, then your opponent randomly adds one of them to your hand and shuffles the others into the deck. And if this card would be destroyed while equipped with any number of equipped spells, you can send one of those cards to the grave instead. So even though Power Tool has some mediocre attack, your equipped spells can help make up for it, and they even passively add protection. The random nature of the search does kinda suck to the untrained eye. See, it doesn't say all the equip spells need to have different names. That's right, we're not working under Esold rules, we're doing things pantheism style, baby! Oh, you know, Noble Knight Boars? Anyone? This has been used, much like Ancient Fairy Dragon, as a really powerful enabler. In this instance, searching out some of the game's most absurd equip spells to gain an enormous amount of advantage. And with the introduction of Morphtronic Earfawn, you can make sure this card gets protection and double attacks every turn. Now you're playing with power. Tools. From here, Power Tools evolution branches off in multiple directions. If we go by the anime, then once Leo grows into his true signer powers, Power Tool Dragon becomes Lifestream Dragon, a level 8 Earth Dragon Synchro Tuner monster with 2900 attack and 2400 defense, requiring one tuner and Power Tool Dragon as material. 
When this card is Synchro Summoned, you can make your life points become 4,000. You also take no effect damage while this monster is on the field. And if this face-up card on the field would be destroyed, you can banish an equip spell card from your grave instead. So now you have a lot more attack power, can now use cards in your grave for protection instead of losing your shields via back row removal, and bonus, no effect damage, you know, for what it's worth. You can also come back from a bad situation by setting your life points to 4,000 if you're lower than them. Or, heck, just tread your own down to 4,000 if you want. There are all kinds of weird strategies out there. And being a Synchro Tuner gives you another avenue for some busted cards. And it might be able to accomplish even more stuff if it stopped obsessing over Final Fantasy VII. Everyone knows that Legend of the Dragoon is the superior RPG. If we look at the manga, you'll see Power Tool Mecha Dragon, a card with all the same stats and summoning conditions as Power Tool, but is Dark Attribute instead of Earth. During your turn, when any number of equipped spell cards are equipped to this card, you can draw a card. That's a hard once per turn, by the way, just so people can't think you can cycle equip spells on there. And once per turn, during either player's turn, you can target an appropriate face-up equip card on the field and equip that target to this monster. This means you can do some wacky stuff where you equip an attack booster to a different monster, have them attack, then Tailor of the Fickle that over to Mecha Dragon so it can use the attack boost, and you get a draw for your troubles. You can even change the equip of an opponent's equipped card to Mecha Dragon, that's so wild. I'd love to see this played in more equipped focused decks, but then we'd have to start making equipped decks that also don't have better things they can be doing. Besides, I don't think that Mecha Dragons would mesh well with the medieval aesthetics of French knighthood in the Infernoble Knights, nor the feudal aesthetics of Japanese temples in Mikanko's. Then we have the latest version of this monster, Power Tool Braver Dragon, a level 9 Earth Machine Synchro monster with 2500 attack and 2300 defense, requiring generic material. If this card is special summoned, you can equip up to 3 equip spells with different names from your deck and or grave to this card. And during any main phase, as a quick effect, you can send one of your equip spells equipped to this card to the grave, then target an effect monster on the field and either change its battle position, or until the end of the turn, negate its effects. Damn, Power Tool glowed up! In fact, if you look at it, you can see some of Livestream Dragon underneath, so it's like it adopted the armor of its former self, which I think is pretty neat. But uh, focusing back on the card itself, it's so good. It's basically build your own boss monster, letting you slap three equipped cards from your deck or grave on it to give it any number of bonus effects, from increasing attack power to adding protection. And then you can cash those cards in for onboard effect negation or Battle Phase Manipulation, which, as it turns out, works very well with Morphtronics. And the best part? You can just summon this with Ultimaya Zulkin. While it usually only summons level 7 or 8 Dragon Synchros, it can also summon Power Tool Synchro Monsters, and because this triggers on Special Summon, not just Synchro Summon, you still get all the value. This card is radical, but because it requires the use of Equip Spells, this monster is reserved only for the Brave at heart. Now, a really good equip card you can put on this is Life Extreme. It can only be equipped to an Earth Synchro monster, and if the equipped monster battles an opponent's monster, it loses 1500 attack during that damage calculation only. Once per turn, if a monster's battle position is changed, except during the damage step, you can target a card on the field and destroy it. And if this card is sent from the Spell and Trap zone to the grave, you can tribute a Power Tool Synchro monster to special summon a Life Stream Dragon from your extra deck and this summon is treated as a Synchro Summon, so you do get the life point setting effect. On Braver, this can make it so it wins against anything with less than 4000 attack, and effectively turns its position changing effect into removal. And the best part is, that Lifestream Dragon that you get, since it's a tuner monster, any of your non-tuner level 1 monsters can tune with it to make another Braver Dragon to re-equip this from the grave. It's almost like unlocking three more effects of Braver Dragon, and God help you if the Karakuris get a hold of this. If you think the battle position synergies are scary now, wait until you see the mechanized puppets that took over an entire region from their fleshy creators to live in peace. Now that's extreme. A card that isn't good to equip to Braver Dragon is Double Tools C and D. However, it's a great equip for Power Tool Dragon, as well as any level 4 or lower machine Morphtronic monster you control. 
While equipped during your turn, the equipped monster gains a thousand attack, and any effect of its attack target that activates or is applied on the field is negated during that battle phase. During your opponent's turn, your opponent can't select monsters other than the equipped monster as an attack target, and an opponent's monster that battles the equipped monster is destroyed at the end of the damage step. So your opponent is really going to want to remove this before going to the battle phase, otherwise they're going to have to trade out a few of their resources to get by you. Equipping this to Power Tool Dragon is pretty neat, because not only does it make Power Tools a legit offensive threat, clocking in at 3300, its protection effect can force your opponent to ram a lot of monsters into Power Tool, and losing a lot in the process. And thankfully, this also equips to most of our Morphtronics. Radeon unfortunately doesn't get to have it, but Video makes for a great target since it still benefits from its 800 point boost. And Boom Boxin becomes a 2200 double attacker. Now, if they could have just given Braver Dragon a little errata so you could equip it with this, that'd be perfect. But we're not gonna get that, so the C and D on this card here stands for cranky and disappointed. Our last card is Power Break, a normal trap card that you can only activate while you control a face-up power tool dragon. You select up to three equipped cards on your field and or in your grave and return them to the deck and inflict 500 damage to your opponent for each card returned. So you get a little bit of burn damage while recycling your equip spells. Not something Braver Dragon needs, but base power tool can only search from the deck so you get to put them back where you need them while hitting your opponent for a nifty chunk of damage. But despite that, recycling and burn isn't exactly going to shake up the meta. It just doesn't have enough power to break anything. All right, that's all the Leo and Luna cards, and despite having more characters this time around, this episode has really only focused on a singular archetype. So what do we do with Morphtronics? Well, we Telephone Loop, obviously. We fill up our extra deck with all kinds of powerful and broken Link monsters and go to town. But considering how fragile the loop is if it gets interrupted, we'll need a backup game plan, and I think the board and rush is where it's at. We don't really have the cards needed to fuss around with anything else, so our main goal is to assemble enough Morphtronic base damage to throw at our opponent's face via Borden's direct attack, and failing that, hide behind some stupendously powerful synchros, like the aforementioned Braver Dragon. But what can we play to help them out? Well, as a machine deck with a bunch of small monsters, Machine Duplication is here to help put that Telephone Loop immediately into play. But if we're not lucky enough to hit that, we can also duplicate Cellphone, which gives you three chances to fish for those Telephones. Now, one of the things that break the Telephone Loop, on top of, you know, a lot of things, is Graveyard Disruption, and at the time of recording, every top deck has a great way to do that in the main deck via Keldo and Mudora. So for the love of God, play Ghost Bell! Because a majority of our monsters are Earth, you can take advantage of a lot of Earth-centric synergies. We can make the best Naturia and Goyo synchros, with a nifty option being Gaia Armor Dragon Shell. It recycles your synchros, great for making the most of your limited extra deck space, and can equip it to any monster special summoned from the extra deck while in the grave, granting you a draw whenever that monster attacks or is attacked. Plus, that's a free equipped to Braver Dragon to use for its negation slash battle position changer. We also, of course, have Vernasylphs, and while using them, we'll shut off our access to Slingin' and Scopin's activated effects. The rest of the cards we care about that activate are Earth, so we're all in the clear. Infinitrax might also be a fun inclusion. Anchor Drill can mobilize our Earth Machine Morphtronics alongside it, and then we can modulate their levels to help make Xyz and Synchro plays. Though, to keep our flexibility at maximum, I'd recommend against using Brutal Dozer. And, as a cute little overlap, Heavy Forward can change the battle positions of a Machine Xyz monster we control to get more counters on Morphtronic map. If we're going for that Morphtronic OTK, you know what might help? Limiter Removal! True, Radeon is a Thunder, so they won't be able to benefit, but Boom Boxin is a machine, and that boost from Radeon interacts with Limiter in a funny way. See, it doubles the attack of your machine monsters, so it takes into account the boost. So it factors in their attack at the time of resolution, including any boosts. So a Boom Boxin with a single boost will get doubled all the way up to 4,000. So with two attacks, that's lethal right there. But you know how we can make Radeon a machine? Well, with DNA Surgery! Okay, the real answer is Clockwork Knight, a continuous spell that makes all monsters on the field machines, and it gives our machines a 500 attack boost while debuffing our opponent's monsters by 500. That's a 
huge swing, and if our goal is to win via battle damage, it is a huge help. Though, uh, make sure you use your machine duplications before you activate this, because this effectively shuts it off. Oh, and speaking of new cards coming out in the Battle of Legend Crystal's Revenge set, the Duke Devlin cards are pretty nutty. The field spell Dice Dungeon searches you the card Dimension Dice, which lets you tribute a monster to special summon a monster with a dice rolling effect from your hand or deck, as long as we control a monster with a dice rolling effect. So we have a way to cash in cell phones to turn them into telephones. How's that for a trade-in plan? As for a silly tech pick, try Book of Eclipse. If your opponent's field is full of attack position monsters, every non-link goes to face down defense position, meaning you don't have to deal with their effects, and each one counts as a position change, which means more counters for a Morphtronic map. So not only do you have a great disruption tool, your monsters get a significant power boost. And that's all I have to say about Leo and Luna's cards. Mostly Morphtronics. The new support is interesting, and while at any moment Telephone FTK threatens to come back to the format, they're otherwise just a bunch of little scrunglies that have janky effects that are fun to mess around with. I do wish that the game had a Luna archetype and was made in a way that had synergies with Morphtronics to really show their connection, and maybe with enough time, we'll get them. All I know is that I've personally been looking forward to covering these little dudes for a long time, because when growing up, one of my good friends from high school played this deck with all his heart, and really showed me and everyone else we hung out with that if you dedicate enough time to a deck, you learn more about what it can do than the naysayers will ever forget. And honestly, that's one of the most Yu-Gi-Oh things ever. If you're watching this orange man, thanks for the memories. Never change. Or actually, I guess change a lot, that's the whole Morphtronic thing. But now, I want to hear what you all have to say. What kinds of cards would you like to see for Luna? What Morphtronic cards would you make if given the chance? And how brave do you really think Braver Dragon is? Let me know in the comments, and if you haven't already, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to show your support, ring that bell so you don't miss an episode, and share this video with someone you know who loves Yu-Gi-Oh! It really does a lot to help me out. Today's episode was brought to you by my lovely patrons, including this month's illustrious Quasar Commander Harry, the ominous benefactor, Nebula Navigator's Third Dynasty, Adam Zagidel, Avi Chali, Kane Senpai, Cameron Berg, Cozy Boat 275, Eric, Frankie, Genesis Yu-Gi-Oh, Gloomba 331, Great Big Pillock, Ironic, John Manji, Julius Sneezer, Larakia, Mana Charge, Marluxia as a girl, Meteornis, Michael Madsen, Mighty Action X, Muziki Clark, Neo Trinity, Panther J, Rebel King Lucifer, Rem T Bright, RJ the Jank Monarch, Ruxith Sarani, Sophie, apparently, The Fresh Prince of Conair, The Wizard Moose, True Neutral, Xander Wolfensberger and Zyrus, Cosmic Crusaders, Ariel Kersey, Bear Sharktopus Studios, Chaz Ghost, Chris Kessler, Corbinisms, Dallas Modest, Emony, Eva Padilla, Howling Zangetsu, Herbal D, Jesus Garcia, Kale the Dragon, King Scarlet Yu-Gi-Oh, Lord whoop de doo Manga Pages, Marion James E. Picotta, Matt Simmons, Nitromo, Sarah Lo Sulshi, Shaquille Solomon, Shooting Star 3300, Star Lord 777, Super Purd, Tucker Ordorn and the Legendary Raven, as well as the wonderful Starlight Explorers you see on screen now. I'm only able to continue doing this thanks to the support of these lovely people, so if you'd like to be a part of these credits, as well as help me in my journey to cover all of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s archetypes, please check out my YouTube membership or Patreon links in the description to see if I have anything you'd like on offer. And if you'd like to see another big milestone special, make sure to check out my big video about Yusei Fudo and his many, many cards. And if you want to see two Yugi tubers going at it, check out Noah Jenk and I's latest series progression polls, where your voice shapes the format. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.